We are, um, <clears throat> we are going to begin a new uh, set of conversations. The next several weeks we'll be looking at the letter of Paul uh, to the Galatians. And um, there are some, some questions about the book of Galatians. Um, traditionally, people thought that it, it was written um, in the mid-50s A.D., and that Paul was writing to people in North Galatia. Let me show you where that is. So uh, this is the, the part of the world we're looking at, so Asia Minor. And there's two, two parts of Galatia. There's kind of the, the northern region and the southern region. And um, uh, traditionally, people thought that Paul was writing to the, to the North Galatians. And uh, if so, that would make a, a date in the 50s more, more likely. But increasingly, scholars think that he was writing to uh, uh, churches in the, the south part of Galatia, in which case they have to move, you know, just in terms of the chronology of Paul's life, they have to move it up several years. And so if they're right about that, and like I say, there's some debate, uh, but um, if they're right, this is the earliest letter in the New Testament. It, the, the other candidate is 1 Thessalonians, which we've heard before, but um, this may, be, may have been written as early as 47 or 48 AD. So very early writing from Paul, if that's true. So, um, so it is. It is a. You know, it is a, um, an interesting uh, letter. It's it's um, it's uh, important because of its earliness, but it's also important because of its content, and um, uh, it is particularly important to uh, Protestant Christians. So, um, in the 1500s, a lot of the early Protestant reformers were were particularly. Um, uh, uh, impressed or excited with what they, what they found in the letter to the Galatians. And so we'll be talking about that as we go. Um, Martin Luther, the, uh, the, the guy who started the Lutheran church, he said this, the epistle to the uh, Galatians is my epistle. To it, I am, as it were, in wedlock. It is my Catherine, Catherine von Bora, his wife. So he says, this is, that's how important this is. This is the epistle for me. You know, if you've ever wondered, is it okay to have a favorite, favorite book of uh, scripture? You know, it's like, well, what about all the others? Martin Luther had a favorite book of Scripture. So, so we'll be looking at this and trying to understand what it is that he found so important about it. Um, um, but today we're just going to really get started. We're going to set the table and then we'll come back to it and pick it up where we leave off. So it begins like letters always do. It begins um, uh, from Paul, an apostle who is not sent from human authority or commissioned through human agency, but sent through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and from all the brothers and sisters with me. So Paul, Paul has this a lengthy explanation of who he is. And the reason for that is that if we read the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we never hear anything about Paul. Paul's not part of that group. When Jesus calls his disciples, when he sends them out on, on a missionary trip, Paul's not in that group. Paul is nowhere to be found in the in the, the biographies of Jesus in the New Testament. He doesn't come into the story until significantly later in the time of the, the Acts of the Apostles. So that's the place where we first hear about it and we hear what he's talking about here. He says, he says I was sent, um, uh, not sent from human authority or commissioned through human agency, but sent through Jesus Christ, that he had uh, an encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and that his calling, his ministry comes out of that direct call, not because he traveled around the Holy Land with Jesus uh, during his earthly ministry, but because Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. So he says, he says, that's who is writing this. And then, oh, by the way, some others are with me. And um, this is really from me. So I'm not even going to bother naming them because this is me, Paul, writing to you. And I've got some things I need to make sure you understand. So he says, to the churches in Galatia, and again, we don't know exactly which churches he was thinking of. Um, people are, are, like I said, are increasingly thinking it was part of Paul's, the churches that Paul would have known from his first missionary journey. So uh, he went through um, Cyprus and then up into S Southern Asia Minor, circled around for a little bit with Barnabas, and then came back to Antioch where he was based from. So, so that's the place he's writing it to, those various churches, wh whichever ones they are, so probably including those there. And you know what comes next in a letter, right? I've, I've, done the, I've done the from and I've done the to. What, what's the next word in a letter? What? Great. No, 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 not this letter. No, no, no. In our letters, yes, you're right. Um, but, but in the letters we write, right? You're, you're writing a letter to the, the phone company because they've got your bill wrong. What do you say? You say, dear, right? You don't know them from Adam. You don't know who's even going to answer the mail, right? You say, dear sir or madam, something like that. 
we have a convention. The next word that comes out of us is dear, right? Um, maybe in some business letter we might say to whom it may concern, but, but in a common letter we would say dear. There's these conventions we go through, and so Paul has a salutation too. In his era, they didn't say, they didn't say, um, they didn't say dear. They said something like this. Paul says, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, you're right, it is grace. He says, grace and peace to you um, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important to remember that because as we will see, Paul is, is agitated in this letter. He's, he's maybe irritated. He may be flat out uh, burning hot angry. Um, Paul is not at his most lovable in this letter. And so it's important to remember that when we read the rest of the letter, everything else we find, it has to be filtered through this, right? Grace and peace. He says, he says um, from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul may be upset right now, but here's what God has in store for you. Grace and peace. What does he mean by that? Grace is, is the unmerited favor of God. That not because of something you've done to deserve it, but simply because God loves you. God, God has unconditional positive regard for you. And that's, you know, what, what you've done with your life or the way that, you know, you've been treated or the way people have treated you um, uh, is immaterial to that. God has grace for you. God, God loves you and wants the best for you. Peace, he wants, he wants wholeness, spiritual as well as material wholeness. He wants you to be healthy and well and have well-being. So grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind as we read the rest of the letter. So as soon as he mentions uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul can't contain himself. He goes off on a little tangent. Every time Paul kind of stops and thinks about this, he has to launch into a prayer of uh, doxology where he gives glory to God. He says, He, Jesus, gave himself for our sins so he could deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So we're going to come back to that. What, is, what does it mean that he delivered us from this present evil age? But right now, Paul is just kind of, he's, he's throwing that out because he's right now praising God. So he says, to God be the glory forever and always. Amen. So Paul can't resist the opportunity to praise God for what he's done in Jesus. And so he throws in this little prayer. Now, now he's done the, the from, the to, and the salutation. Now, he does something that, or, or in, in Paul's letters, what he normally does is what everybody in the first century did. We know this from, from biblical letters. We also know it from secular letters. The next thing that would happen in a letter in the first century is you'd give thanks to a God or to the gods or some particular God, Jupiter or whatever. You'd give thanks to God for something to do with your recipient, right? I thank God because you know, this thing is happening in your life or whatever. That would be the normal thing. And Paul typically does that in his letters. Um, in, in Paul's letters, for example, in the, um, in the letter to the Philippians, he says, I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. In the letter, first letter to Thessalonians, he says, we always thank God for all of you when we mention you constantly in our prayers. He does this in most of his letters, but not in Galatians. In Galatians, he goes straight into it. He says, I'm amazed. I'm astounded. I am I am struck dumb. I am I'm wondering that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ to follow another gospel. So what does he mean by that? Well, as he says, it's not really another gospel. There is no other gospel. This is the gospel. But he says certain people, and he'll talk more about those in uh, upcoming weeks, certain people are confusing you and they want to change the gospel of Christ. However, don't pay any attention to them. If we ourselves, or a heavenly angel, should ever preach anything different from what we preach to you, they should be under a curse. And then let me underscore that. And remember, these are handwritten letters. So Paul's about to repeat himself. It always means something when people repeat themselves in handwritten letters. He says, if anyone preaches something different from what you received, they should be under a curse. So, the gospel, not a gospel. There is no other gospel. Anybody who comes up with another gospel, as far as Paul is concerned, they should be under a curse. So what is a gospel? What does he mean when he says gospel? Well, the, um, the, it has to do with the, the understanding of time, oddly enough. So you've probably heard people say um, that, that uh, time is cyclical, that, that 
Um, there's nothing new under the sun, that time goes around, you know, what goes around comes around, that, um, that uh, you know, the empires rise and empires fall, but nothing really changes. You hear people say, you know, things, things don't really change. And so this is, this is a conception that a lot of people have about time, that it just goes on, it, it, it just unfolds, but ultimately it kind of circles back on itself and things aren't really that different. Maybe your life feels that way, um, maybe, maybe it doesn't, but um, it, uh, Solomon felt that way when he wrote that in the book of the, uh, uh, in the Ecclesiastes. He said, nothing is new under the sun. Now I have to tell you, Solomon was way out by himself when he wrote that. There's almost nothing else in the Hebrew scriptures that suggests that that is, what, that is the way of reality. Solomon was very depressed. I mean, read the book. Solomon was having a very bad day when he wrote this because uh, the traditional understanding of Jews is that time is going somewhere. That, that time is moving forward, that, that it's not a cycle, it's not going to circle back on itself and be the same old thing over and over again. God is taking the world somewhere. The world is going someplace. And so that would be the, the uh, Christian understanding and the Jewish understanding of time is that it is moving, it is, it is going someplace. And so when Paul says this present evil age, he's saying time, right? That's, that's where we live. We live in, in this present age. And by the way, if you've looked at it and said to yourself, this really stinks. You know, we just prayed about the war in Ukraine and uprisings in Senegal and so forth. This world has a lot of things that are very troublesome, that are very objectionable. So he says it's an evil age, this present age, that, and, he, and he says God has delivered us from it. Now, in traditional Jewish understanding, they would have had the idea of this, that there is the present evil age, and then there is the age to come. This is where God is taking things. Yes, this, this age is, is evil, but there is another age that is coming. I should do my hands backwards. So there's another age that's coming that is better, that, that everything that makes this, this age bad will be gone in the age to come. God is going to fix all the problems with this age, and then we will have the age to come. So that's, that's the traditional Jewish understanding. And what they would have said is... Um, you need to be right with God because if you're not, there's going to be a hard stop there, right? When the day of the Lord comes, it's not going to be pretty for you because you're not, if you're not right with God, you're not coming into the age to come. So, you know, you get into, you know, very vivid metaphors about, um, you know, wailing and gnashing of teeth and things like that. So, you know, if you're part of this age, this present evil age, and you're not right with God, then you're headed for trouble. And so uh, that is the traditional understanding that Jews would have had, that there's this age and the age to come. God is taking us somewhere. But you need to pause and ask yourself, where, you know, where will I be when the, new, when, when the new age dawns? And what Paul says, Paul says, here's the good news. Okay, Gospel means good news. Paul's not saying, here's, here's you know, seven tips for how to get right with God. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, I've got good news. What is the good news? He says, the, the age to come has already happened. That when Jesus came in his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus inaugurated the age to come. And the present, the present evil age is continuing alongside it for a while until Jesus comes again. When Jesus comes again at the end of this age, then there will be a, a, a day of the Lord, and then you have those questions about what happens next. But he says, he says, Jesus has acted. The good news, the gospel, is that Jesus has delivered us from the present evil age. This is, this is not instructions for what you need to do. This is an announcement of good news about what God has already done. So Jesus has delivered us from the age to come. So the gospel is the good news that the new age is here. And people might say, well, wait a minute, that's not, that's not what I was expecting. I was expecting one arrow, one age to smash into and start a brand new age. I was expecting something different. It says, oh, let me tell you about expectations. God is very surprising. God keeps his word, but he surprises us. So how does he say that? Well, he says, um, uh, he, he says am I trying to win uh, over human beings or God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be Christ's slave. And then he says, 
Yeah, I understand. This is not what we were expecting. You know, what happened to me on the road to Damascus is God revealed this thing, which, which I was prepared for, sort of, but at the same time, he surprised me. So he says, um, he says, I want you to know the gospel. I preached this in human in origin. I didn't learn it, um, receive it or learn it from a human. It came through a revelation from Jesus Christ. He says, you heard about my previous life in Judaism, how I severely ha harassed God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my peers because I was much more militant about the traditions of my ancestors. You've heard the stories about the old Paul. You know, you know how I was. And he says, but God, but God, God moved me in the same way that God changed my understanding of, of uh, the age to come. God has changed me. That God is full of surprises. That if you think you've got God figured out, God will keep his promises, but he may surprise you in how he does it. He certainly surprised Paul. He says, he was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach about him to the Gentiles. So Paul understands his his mission, God has sent him to preach to Gentiles, so non-Jews. And he says, I didn't immediately consult with any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see the men who were apostles before me either. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He says, they had a different mission. They are uh, presenting the gospel to Jews. That's their mission. I have a different mission. I didn't need to consult with them because Jesus already told me what I needed to do. So he says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem. I, nobody instructed me there because they have a different mission. My mission is to the Gentiles. So Paul says, this is the surprising thing. Jesus has already acted. Jesus has already delivered us from this present evil age. So the present evil age essentially continues along beside the new age that has come. And it's... It's something that, that we have to evaluate in the sense of this. He says, he says, he gave himself for our sins so that he could deliver us from this present evil age. So he's saying, God will surprise you. God surprised me. He moved me out of the present evil age into the age to come. But he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting to follow another gospel. Instead of remaining in this new age that has come, you're going back. Like, like the Israelites wanting to go back to Egypt. Why would you want to go there? Why would you want to go back to the old age, the age that is, that is passing away? He says, I am shocked. I'm stunned that you are so quickly falling away, that you are, you are going back to the old age. So he says that that is, that is the, the, the puzzle that he's working out or talking about in this letter. And it's where he's going to go in the rest of the letter. But, but uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna leave it here, but I wanna, I wanna summarize it kind of this way. So, so the first thing is as we go through this letter, including you know, hard things he says about you know, you're, you're deserting the, the thing that Jesus has done, to remember that filter, the, the grace and peace. This letter is sent um, in, in recognition and in celebration of God's peace, that God, God has grace and peace for us. So this is not, you know, now you've done it. This is, hey, remember what God is like. And the second thing is to remember that, that God is full of surprises. History is going someplace. That, that if you are defeated or you're depressed and you think like, like Solomon did in Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun, remember that God surprises people. He certainly surprised Paul and he can surprise you too. God is faithful. God will keep his promises. But the way he does it will almost certainly surprise you. So hang in there. God is faithful. So God can surprise you because the new age has come. And lastly, you can only be part of one age. You can't, you can't be part of the new age and the age that is passing away. That's what Paul is troubled by, that some people are choosing to go back to live as if Jesus had never come, as if Jesus had never delivered them from the old age, the, the, the age that is passing away. So you can only have one, but it's nothing you have to do to have the age to come. Jesus has already delivered us from the present evil age. So the question for us is to ask, why would people do that? You know, 
I'd like you to think about that and then come back next week because we'll see some of the reasons. And they had good reasons for deserting the, a, the present age, the, the new age, the new age that has come, why they went back to the old one. They had reasons. But ask yourself, why would you do that? If, if you have been delivered from the age that is passing away, the, the, the day of the Lord and all the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth, if you've already been delivered from that, why would you want to go back? Why? What would make you go back? That's what we're going to talk about next week. In the meantime, you probably have reasons of your own, you know, maybe different from the people in the first century, but there are reasons where you say, you know, I'm not sure if I can trust God in this. I'm not sure because God, God may change his mind. God may not do what I had hoped he would do. And so if, if, you, if you have ever felt that way, if you feel that way today, I want to encourage you because, because Jesus knew it would be a while. And so he gave us a sacrament to, to sustain us. When we move into the age to come, the place, the, the way to celebrate that is with baptism. But after we've been baptized, after we've moved into the age to come, to help us stay in the age to come and not move back to the old age, Jesus gave us the sacrament of the table. He invites us here so that we can be sustained um, and, and remember what he has done for us. So I invite you now to prepare your hearts to receive the gift that Jesus offers at this table.